Let me tell you a little bit about today's presenter, and uh, it is my pleasure to introduce you to Professor Amy Shank. Amy is an ardent reader of Jane Austen's works and a full-time professor of English here at Wenatchee Valley College. She's been a teacher for 14 years and uh, has taught at all grade levels except for preschool. Okay. Uh, and she has taught all over the place in Mexico, the U.S., and the U.K. At Wenatchee Valley College, she teaches composition and literature. <coughs> She earned her bachelor's in English from Eastern Washington University, her master in teaching from Whitworth, and her master's in English from Eastern Washington University. Her areas of study are Victorian literature, Romantic literature, American literature, and women's memoir writing. It's interesting. I was listening to a podcast not long ago, and the, um, uh, the presenter mentioned that when when women write these things, you call them diaries, but when men write them, they're called journals. Because men don't write diaries. <laughs> um, which I think actually may relate to, to uh, Amy's talk today. She's a member of the National Council of Teachers of English, the Modern Language Association, and the Jane Austen Society of North America. Professor Shank. Um, thank you very much for joining us. Um, I'm very honored to be the first speaker in the WBC Speaks series. Um, and I'm also honored to have the opportunity to share uh, my great love of the works of Jane Austen with all of you. And yes, I am wearing a corset. <laughs> and no, it is not comfortable. <laughs> um, I've been reading Austen since I was 12. Uh, not quite as long as I've been reading Charlotte Bronte, but pretty close. And since it's a truth universally acknowledged that a single woman graduate student of good intelligence must be in want of a thesis topic, <laughs> I've made much of my professional life a study of her works. And there's the lady herself. Um, I came up with the idea to give this talk because it seems strange to me that after 204 years, we still have the need to defend the works of Jane Austen as literature. Um, uh, in her own way, she's as much a cultural icon as William Shakespeare, but she's often devalued. And I think that's largely because she was a woman and she was writing about women um, at a time when women were not um, not supposed to be in the public eye. And I can't move my arm, so, okay. Um, the debate about Austen's work has been pretty much raging since she was published. It's largely centered around the status of, like I said, of, of her as a writer, whether she's a writer of literature with a capital L or a writer of what we call chick lit, okay? <laughs> Um, so I thought we could delve a little deeper into why this debate exists today. The first thing, of course, is to understand how most of us experience Austin's work. And those of you who have taken a class from me know that I rarely lecture, so we're going to do a little audience participation at this point. Uh, how many of you have seen a film version of Austin's first book, Sense and Sensibility? How many of you have read the book? Kind of interesting. 
Uh, how many of you have seen a film version of Pride and Prejudice? Okay, and how many of you have read that book? Uh, what is Pride and Prejudice about? Romance. Romance? Okay. Strategic life planning. AKA <laughs> <laughs> romance. AKA romance. Okay. Is it about anything else? Life struggles. Okay. What about how prejudice gets in the way of relationships? Mm -hmm. How to escape a wacky mom. <laughs> yes, very true. Um, what about Sense and Sensibility? What is that book about? Or the film, if you've seen the film version. No one knows. Can you remind us the character name? <laughs> uh, the two main sisters are Eleanor and Marianne. You didn't ask us how long ago we read it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Good point. Sharon. Sure. Um, Sense and Sensibility. So the two sisters have conflict over whether you should just live and let live and let your emotions out, or whether you should have the British reserve and be a little bit more careful what you show to the public as you strategically like things. <laughs> yes, a.k.a. Actually, romance. Actually, yeah. they, get, they get battered by the limitations allowed to them. Absolutely, yeah. Specifically the limitations of, of women's ability to earn a living in that story, yeah. And you could say that applies to Pride and Prejudice. It's just put off because Mr. Bennett is still living during the course of the story. But, yeah, okay. Uh, how many of you have seen a film version of Emma? So if you've seen Clueless and you're not raising your hand, your hand should be in the air, because that's an updated Emma. Uh, how many of you have read the book? Wow, way fewer people than I thought for that one. <laughs> um, okay, and so how would we classify those works? If we were gonna say these are, these movies are this kind of movie, what would we say? A chick flick. <laughs> a period piece. Okay. Chick flick overtones. Comedy. Okay. Maybe a rom com. Rom com. Yeah. Okay. How women negotiate society using interpersonal skills. With what goal? Find a place for their intelligent being within the constraints of society. Okay. All right. So I'm, I'm seeing some interesting stuff. First of all, not everyone who has read the book has seen the film. So there were different people raising their hands. But generally speaking, more people raised their hands when I asked, have you seen the film? Versus, have you read the book, okay? Um, the idea here is that most of us experience Austin's work through the film adaptations of her novels, okay? Um, and some, sometimes we're not aware that we're actually doing that. If you've seen Bride and Prejudice or if you've seen Bridget Jones's Diary, those are actually remakes of Jane Austen novels. So, um, And that experience of viewing her stories through the film medium has a huge impact on the way we view Austen uh, in general. Uh, the problem comes in when we don't often distinguish between the film version and the novel. Because stuff is being focused on in the films that's not focused on in the novels. Uh, most of us think that Austen's novels are romance novels, when in fact they're far more complex than romance novels usually. Okay. So, <laughs> so if we're going to apply this slide to Austin, what would be the, the answer most women would say? Mr. Darcy. Not me. I like Captain Wentworth. Persuasion. So romance novels, this is a definition. They place the primary focus on the relationship and romantic love between two people. According to the Romance Writers of America, the main plot of a romance novel must revolve around two people 
as they develop romantic love for each other and work to build a relationship. Furthermore, a romance novel must have an emotionally satisfying and optimistic ending. <laughs> so, um, if we're thinking of that definition in terms of the film versions of Austin, what is that emotionally satisfying and optimistic ending? How, how do most of the films of Austin's work end? Engagement. Yeah, the wedding. Or engagement. Or, they live happily ever after. Yeah, happily ever after. Um, and the films, like I said, usually focus on the love story at the expense of the rest of the plot. Does anybody know how many of Austin's six novels end with the wedding? One. That's Emma. The rest of them, there's the wedding, and then Austin goes on to talk about some of the problems that her married couples face after the wedding. So we don't have that idea of happily ever after in the novels. Okay? So the focus for the film, since that's how most people experience Austin's work, has resulted in a sort of cult for fans of Jane Austen. Uh, many of these people are fans of the films and they've never read the book. Many of them go online and buy a Regency dress pattern and have a very nice person make them up a dress. Okay? Um, so fans of Jane Austen have referred to themselves as Janeites since 1894 coinage of the word by literary scholar George Saintsbury in an introduction to a new edition of Pride and Prejudice. Janeites today, what, what, who does that group consist of? Women. Women, yeah, almost exclusively. <clears throat> Originally it was all men. It was all literary scholars and um, they, were, they were mostly men. And um, Rudyard Kipling even wrote a short story called The Janeites that was about a group of soldiers in World War I who were fans of Jane Austen's work. Okay. So that's very different than our experience. Okay. So, let me see here. Yeah. <laughs> so according to Elise Barker, in <laughs> according to Elise Barker in her article "Playing with Jane Austen: Gender Identity in the Narrowing of Interpretation," the facts that many women read her and that so many of her diehard fans are women establish her as a woman's author related to chick lit or romance. Associated with women's genres like chick lit and romance, her novels are being read in terms of the discourse conventions of those novels. Similarly, some readers discount her writing as merely about domestic concerns. For instance, her work does not unambiguously reinforce rigid social roles, but it is often assumed that it does. These attitudes reflect a narrowing in the way that we read Austen, and part of what might cause this narrowing of interpretation is that her readership latches on to certain aspects of her work, the romance plot in particular, at the expense of others such as biting social commentary and sophisticated irony. So we can't necessarily be blamed for viewing Austen's work as chick lit or fluff instead of literature with a capital L. Uh, our understanding of it comes from fandom. In one article that I read, J Knights were compared to Trekkies. So same idea, okay? Uh, but Austen, because she critiques society and because the central concern of her novels is how women function in that society, like Ralph said, uh, is definitely not a writer of romances, per se. Though there are romantic subplots of the books, and though many of her books are about <coughs> marriage, that's not the central focus. Instead, she's a writer of what we call the novel of manners, which is a realistic story that concentrates the reader's attention upon the customs and conversation and the ways of thinking and valuing of people of a certain social class. The narrative structure recreates a social world and shows the spheres of public and private life sufficiently to convey the dominance of social code, social code mores upon the personal and public lives of the people in the story. Very different focus than who's dating and when, are they going to get married by the end of the book. Okay. Um, I contend that we have this debate about Austen because she was, like I said, a woman writing about women. And she also wrote comedies, which are 
typically been considered lesser literature than drama. Okay. <clears throat> However, she does have very important things to say about economics, education, especially education of women, the class system, psychology, sociology, uh, a lot of other stuff that most people of her time were not saying. Okay. Uh, an example of Austin's ability to critique and satirize society is what my research has been focused on. Um, I think I missed a slide there. Yeah. Okay. Um, my research has been focused on her portrayal of the family unit. So it's been focused on the sociology. Uh, and Jane Austen undermines the notion that there can ever be an ideal family. Okay. As Marilyn Frankes points out in her essay, The Monstrous Mothers of Mansfield Park, Austen positions the reader to recognize the problems of family and society and engage in critique to locate value. And although Austen never tells us directly how to solve the problem of the dysfunctional families she portrays, it's her ability to get us to critique that family structure without even knowing it because her work is funny. So we're laughing at it and critiquing it at the same time that makes her an author worth everybody's time. So I, in my research, I focused on three of her novels. And for these next slides, I, had, um, I chose pictures that uh, illustrate this contrast between the common perception of her work and what I argue her work is actually about. So in the upper left, we have a picture from Sense and Sensibility of Edward and Eleanor at a wedding. So we have the typical ending of the wedding. But down on the bottom right, we have what the novel is actually focused on, is family life. And how do Eleanor and Mary Ann survive? I would contend that more than a lot of her other novels, this novel is about survival. Um, and that's emotional and physical. So in Sense and Sensibility, um, Eleanor and Marianne are, and their younger sister Margaret and their mother are left destitute after their father dies. Um, their half brother pretty much abandons them, so there's no head of the family. Um, and they have to turn to more distant relations for financial support. And the novel, rather than focusing on their quest for love, even though they do both find love and get married, focuses on how they, do, how they negotiate that survival. And it is pitting them against each other in a, in a lot of ways. Because Marianne thinks that the way to survive is to be yourself at all times. And feel your feelings deeply. And Eleanor thinks that to survive you have some of that English reserve and you have to negotiate emotional problems more carefully. Okay? Um, so there's healing at the end of this novel, but it's not one of those really super optimistic endings. The novel doesn't end with the weddings. It goes on to talk about the fact that Eleanor and her husband are, are poverty stricken after their marriage and that Marianne has lost her passion that she thought was the way to survive. So, <clears throat> the last words of the novel are not about their marriages but about their relationship as sisters and it demonstrates her typical use of understatement as humor. There was that constant communication which strong family affection would naturally dictate, and among the merits and the happiness of Eleanor and Marianne, let it not be ranked as the least considerable that those sisters, in living almost within sight of each other, they could live without disagreement between themselves or producing coolness between their husbands. In other words, it was, it was really good that they didn't fight all the time. <laughs> <laughs> um, and like I've been saying, the, the film version um, this particular one is from 1995, it won some Oscars, and it is probably the most famous version of Sense and Sensibility, um, but it does end with the wedding, and things are all happy. Okay. okay, the second novel that I researched is Pride and Prejudice, and here I have a few more pictures. <laughs> the top left is from Bride and Prejudice, which is the Bollywood remake. Pride and Prejudice. And Bridget Jones's Diary, of course, the entire thing, pretty much the plot was lifted from Pride and Prejudice. 
and they even got Colin Firth, who very famously played Darcy, mm -hmm. uh, to be Mark Darcy in Bridget Jones's Diary, even though he wasn't very happy about it. Um, this is Austin's most widely read novel, and the one that's off, this most often cited as a romance. Um, but again, what we have, instead of focus on Elizabeth and Darcy only, we have this portrayal of a really, really dysfunctional family. Uh, the dad is basically, he hides in the library when his wife gets too loud, and his wife is loud and hysterical and completely ignorant. And they have five daughters, and the two oldest daughters, Jane and Elizabeth, have to kind of take up the slack and try to be the parents for their younger siblings. And of course, they're not allowed to be the parents by society because they're not the parents, so their parents end up undermining their attempt to rein in their wild younger sisters. Um, their youngest sister, Lydia, runs away with a man, very scandalous, and endangers all the other sisters' chances of marrying. Um, and the central focus of the novel is that family unit, which at the end of the novel never comes back together. It is relocated to Jane and Elizabeth's respective houses. And they have to take care of Lydia and her husband financially, and they have to take care of their sister Kitty, who they don't want to be living with their parents because their parents are a really bad example. Um, so that focus of how do we repair this broken family unit is really the focus of Pride and Prejudice. And then we have a very nice side story of Darcy and Elizabeth. <laughs> um, and then, of course, we have the two most famous versions of this novel. I prefer the 1995 A&E version, which follows the novel almost exactly. Um, it doesn't follow the novel almost exactly because it does end with the nice, neat, tied up with the red bow, double wedding of Elizabeth and Jane, um, which is not how the novel ends. Um, the 2005 version with Kira Knightley in it departs from the novel in a lot of very significant ways. Uh, and mainly it takes away from that central plot that Austin gives us about the dysfunctional family by making them all just close-knit. You know, they're all happy and they really love each other underneath when that's really, really not the case in the novel. They, they care about each other, and, but it's more of a duty to, to be relatives with each other. Okay. And the last novel that I wanted to focus on today is my favorite, Persuasion. This is uh, Austin's last book. It was published after her death. And it has the least functional family. There is no semblance, as the book opens, of anything resembling a happy family. Um, their mother is dead. There are three daughters. And the father is basically completely irresponsible and only cares about surface things. And um, in Persuasion, um, the oldest daughter has an inflated sense of importance and self-worth. Self -worth. And she and the youngest daughter both emphasize blood ties. Up until this point in Austin, family is still important. Sometimes you can marry and recreate a family of your own, but still have ties with sisters that you're close to. That does not happen in Persuasion. Anne is not close to any of her family. They are completely duty. And she has no emotional ties to them. And she does manage to marry and get away from them, but it's, it's portrayed as an escape, not as happily ever after. Not only that, her husband is a captain. See? Captain Wentworth. <laughs> um, and he is in the Navy. So the end of the book, um, Austin emphasizes the transitory nature of Anne's happiness, because her husband has to go back to war. Uh, Anne was tender in it itself, and she had the full worth of it in Captain Wentworth's affection. His profession was all that could ever make her friends wish that tenderness less. The dread of a future war, all that could dim her sunshine. She gloried in being a sailor's wife, but she must pay the tax of quick alarm for belonging to that profession which is, if possible, more distinguished in its domestic virtues than in its national importance. Okay. Um, like the other film versions, this one solely focuses on the romance between Wentworth and Anne. Um, the book focuses more on Anne's attempt to 
figure out where she fits in in a society that if you're 28, you're a spinster forever. You're never going to get married. So how does she manage to negotiate in that world? Okay. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, we are accustomed to viewing her as a writer of romances, a view that the film industry obviously emphasizes. Uh, but she had some very profound ideas to offer us. Um, and it's not just the ideas that she gives us, it's how she gets them across. Uh, her, novel, her novels are comic novels. They're not slapstick, so um, nobody's falling on stuff or anything. But they contain a lot of satirical commentary on society that, and the people that make it up. Charlotte Bronte, um, who is one of my favorite authors, actually criticized Jane Austen for her lack of passion. Um, and if you've read Jane Eyre or any other of Bronte's works, you'll know why. Uh, but Austen shows us that laughing at ourselves often teaches us just as much as being serious. In a letter to one of her friends, this is what she says. I could no more write a historical romance than an epic poem. I could not sit seriously down to write a serious romance under, under any other motive than to save my life. And if it were indispensable for me to keep it up and never relax into laughing at myself or other people, I'm sure I should be hung before I had finished the last chapter. <laughs> okay. So um, essentially, if we ignore or dismiss Austin's work, we miss out on one of the most discerning and intelligent and hilarious authors available to us. Austin should be taken seriously, not as a domestic writer or a chick lit author, um, or even as a central figure in a cult, but as an important writer. One who gives us a particular insight into the family structure and women's lives at a time when women were not writing a lot, and if they were, they were writing romances. Uh, her work is consistently devalued when it's recast as chick lit or romance writing, rather than being valued as important social and if you don't believe me, think of how much more seriously you'd take me if I weren't wearing this cap. <laughs> <laughs>